Hello. Thank you for stopping by. We are celebrating Women's History Month at the Wren's Nest. Since you can't get to the Wren's Nest right now, they are bringing the programs to you. So settle in and let me tell you about my life. I am Dr. Helen Elizabeth Nash. I was born 1921, one of six children. I attended Spelman College, obtained a Bachelor of Arts degree. Then I wanted to go to medical school. My father, Homer Nash, had concerns about my stamina because at the time I was small. But obviously, as you can see, I grew. Then there was the matter of finances. My grandfather, Antoine Graves, who, by the way, is the only one in the African-American section of historic Oakland Cemetery buried in a mausoleum. The family had properties. I wanted to go to medical school, and my grandfather said, sell one of those properties and send her. That's my grandfather. I attended Mahari Medical School, graduated with honors, and completed my medical residency at Homer G. Phillips a segregated hospital in St. Louis. Later, I joined the staff there. Sit back, let me tell you how this unfolds. I became a pediatrician, known for breaking racial and gender barriers in the medical field. My motivation? I took my cues from my father, who had a successful medical practice in our hometown of Atlanta. I also took cues from my mother who said, demand equal treatment. And I took cues from the diva, Miriam Anderson, who only performed for integrated audiences. I treated thousands of children in my 45 years of practice and became a renowned and respected physician throughout the medical community. It did not begin that way. Once, I was interviewed by Washington University's American Lives Project to recount my earlier experiences as a black female doctor in a white male-dominated medical world. Lots of ugliness and prejudice. I experienced discrimination of the highest order. At that time, I thought it couldn't have been worse. Prejudice was legal, so nobody hid anything. I recall the first black patient I admitted when I worked at Children's Hospital in St. Louis, a little girl, Afro-American, whom I correctly diagnosed with typhoid fever. Once the ugliest attitude doctor came, he wrote a note on her chart. Too bad Dr. Nash started treating the patient because now we'll never know what she had. Was he calling in to question my medical acumen and expertise? Prejudice of the highest order. Homer G. Phillips Hospital was called the city's black hospital. Dr. Park White, my mentor, he and I collaborated to help reduce the premature infant death rate. We just made simple improvement in hygiene and secured better equipment. The infant mortality rate at that time was very high for infants all over the country. Homer G. Phillips had a death rate above 80% because there were no isolation units and no incubators for our little preemies. At Children's Hospital, there was a separate building for black children. They called it the Butler Ward. And in 1945, I think, in came the polio epidemic. And it was kind of kind of a sort of desegregation. Because you see, the only place to isolate polio patients was in the segregated ward. Then the black infants and children were put all around the hospital, depending on their illness. You want to hear more about racism, as I experienced it? At City Hospital, where the Caucasian children were, they were getting ice cream every day. And the black children were not getting any ice cream at all. You know how children love ice cream. Remember, my mother said, demand equal treatment. I said to the powers that be, 
at least let's alternate days so all of our sweet little children can have ice cream. They raise a fuss about that. They got sex wet. The children over here are accustomed to having ice cream every day. I didn't let it rest at that. And then they said, okay, okay. Let everybody have ice cream every day. Have all you want. Just forget it. And you know, we got bananas for the children the same way. Crazy that we had to go through that ritual. All right. So that settled that. Don't you just love motherly advice? So I was going to finish up at Home and G. Phillips and open my own practice in a black business neighborhood in St. Louis. It wasn't as prosperous as Atlanta's Auburn Avenue, but there were several black businesses along the street. Now, what do you suppose folks said when I expressed my desire to go into private practice? I needed money. I went to Bishop Scarlet, the great liberal the friend of the wonderful Eleanor Roosevelt. And he said, go back to the hospital. Nobody wants a woman doctor. He didn't say nobody wanted a black doctor. He said nobody wanted a woman doctor. So now on one hand, I'm fighting racial bias. On the other hand, I'm fighting gender bias. But let me tell you, I was up for the fight. So here's a little glitch, maybe. So the next day, before I was to open my practice, I went home and talked to my father. I said, I can't do it. I don't have any money and so on and so on. He looked at me, gave me $100 and said, go back and do it. You can do it. Don't you just love fathers? He could see I was becoming a success and my father became my greatest supporter. So I came back with my little $100, put it in the bank, and saw my first patient the next day. And that patient came back to me whenever he needed a doctor. And my father gave me some pointers. He said, now listen, you don't need a whole lot of things. Here's what you do. If you see a patient in your office, you need something you don't have, give him or her an appointment for the next day. Go down to Aloe's, get what you need, charge it to me, and see the patient the next day. That's what you do. So in 1949, I hung out my shingle, my own shingle, and my practice boomed. That same year, I became the only woman among the first four African-American physicians to join the staff of Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. I could have returned to Atlanta, but I stayed in St. Louis because of that faculty appointment and because I had physician visiting privileges at St. Louis Children's Hospital. I retired in 1993 as Professor Emeritus of Pediatrics from Washington University School of Medicine. Despite efforts, still fighting some of the same racial battles. I served as Washington University Dean of Minority Affairs. And since 1996, a deserving student has been given the Helen E. Nash Achievement Award. I received honorary doctorate from two universities, received the Women's Medal of Honor and a Lifetime Achievement Award, and serving as a member of the American Academy of Pediatrics and more and more. I built my reputation as an advocate for child welfare. For fun, I played a little piano, did a little gardening. My patients call me the super doctor. They say I was part psychiatrist and part doctor because I wanted to heal the whole patient from the early days and even across racial lines. I wanted to know, what's going on behind that ache? What's going on behind that pain for the whole patient? Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote in one of his poems, Psalms of Life, the grave is not the goal. You have to be passionate and fierce about life. Over the years, I didn't just witness change. Child, I caused change. I'm Dr. Helen Elizabeth Nash, 
Thank you for taking time to share my story. Be passionate and fierce about life and demand equal treatment. Goodbye, good success.